In this video, I'm going to discuss the motor as well as the somatosensory homunculus, and then after that, discuss the clinical symptoms of the lesions of different parts of the brain. So here we have the brain, and as for the anatomy of the brain, we have the frontal lobe right here, the temporal lobe, occipital lobe, parietal lobe, as well as the cerebellum. Now, you can see that the somatosensory cortex is located in the parietal lobe, and this region is responsible for sensing sensations around the body. And then the motor cortex is located in the frontal lobe. And now this motor cortex is responsible for ordering the body parts to move. Now, if you obtain a coronal view of this region of the brain, the somatosensory as well as the motor cortex, that's the view that you will get. And this is the homunculus or map of the body in the brain, and it tells you what regions of the brain will control different parts of the body. So this is for both motor as well as sensory functions. So for instance, the region that is shown in blue will control the motor as well as the sensation of the lower extremities, while the area that is shown in orange will control the upper extremities as well as the face, and then finally the red area is controlling the um, tongue as well as the pharynx. Now the reason that I have different colors for these regions is that there are different arteries that will supply these regions. So anterior cerebral artery will supply the blue area, middle cerebral artery supplies the orange area, and then finally posterior cerebral artery supplies the red area. So you can see that if someone has a lesion of the anterior cerebral artery, then there would be contralateral paralysis as well as loss of sensation of the leg. Likewise, if there is a lesion of middle cerebral artery, then there would be contralateral loss of sensation as well as paralysis of the upper extremities as well as the face. And so with the posterior cerebral artery, there will be problem with the tongue as well as the pharynx. So that was the first concept that I wanted to discuss with you. But in addition to knowing what arteries supply different regions of the brain, you should also be able to recognize that on the image of the circle of Willis. So here is the image and you should try drawing that by yourself. And once you drew that for several times, you should be able to recognize the arteries that are shown in the actual angiography of the brain. So here we have the anterior cerebral artery, which supplies the lower extremities. Then we have the middle cerebral artery, which supplies the upper extremities as well as the facial area. And then finally, we have the posterior cerebral artery, which supplies the tongue as well as the pharynx. All right, now next I would like to discuss the clinical symptoms of lesions of different parts of the brain. So with lesions of the frontal lobes, there would be change in the behavior of the patients. And these patients usually present with apathy, inattention, and disinhibition. If the dominant lobe of the frontal part of the brain is affected, then it would affect the Broca's area, which is responsible for the production of words. So the part of the brain that is responsible for the pronunciation and processing of the sentence production is now affected and so the patient would not be able to speak anymore. With the temporal lobe lesions, if it affects the bilateral amygdala, then patients present with the Kluver-Bussey syndrome where they would have tendency to examine objects by the mouth. They would also have hyperaggression and hypersexuality um, presentations. If it affects the dominant lobe of the brain, then they would have Wernicke aphasia. And with Wernicke aphasia, the patients will not understand the war so they wouldn't be able to comprehend what they hear. So with Wernicke, they have problem with understanding the words, while with Broca, it's a motor aphasia. They cannot pronounce the words. With lesion of the parietal lobe, if it affects the dominant lobe, the patients would be unable to read, write, or do math. They can also not recognize fingers or uh, recognize the right from the left side. And this is referred to as Gerstmann syndrome. And if it affects the non-dominant lobe of the parietal part of the brain, then they would ignore one side of the body. And so here is an example where you can see that the patient has ignored drawing the left side and has only focused on drawing the right side of the image. So here is an image that will show you the Broca's area, Wernicke area, as well as the Gerstmann syndrome. So Gerstmann syndrome is in the parietal lobe, while the Wernicke is in the temporal lobe, and then Broca's is in the frontal lobe. So you can see that if the left side, which is usually the dominant part of the brain, is being affected, then um, these are the symptoms that can arise from lesions of the brain. 
The next two lesions are the cerebellar lesions. So if it affects the medial part of the cerebellum, then patients will have dysarthria. And with dysarthria, there would be paralysis of the muscles of the mouth. And so patients would not be able to speak anymore. With the cerebral hemisphere lesions, there would be slurred speech. And then on examination, they would be pass pointing on the finger nose test. So you will be doing this test a lot during your uh, neurological examination. And if a patient fails to do the finger nose test, then that is due to the lesion of the cerebellar hemisphere. They also have inattention, tremor, as well as nystagmus. And then finally, the high yield point here is to find out where is the nucleus of different cranial nerves located. So with the midbrain, it um, houses the nucleus of cranial nerve three and four. In the pons, there are nucleus of cranial nerve five, six, seven, and eight. Medulla has cranial nerve nine, 10, and 12. And finally, spinal cord has nucleus of cranial nerve 11. Now next, which is the last topic I want to discuss, is to go over lesions of the circle of villus and then discuss the symptoms that can arise from those. So these lesions, for instance, include the Weber syndrome, lateral pontine syndrome, Wallenberg syndrome, and medial medullary syndrome. And I agree that it's really hard to memorize all the symptoms that are associated with each of them. But if you actually understand the concept of where different arteries will supply the part of the brain, then it's really easy to interpret those symptoms and find out what region of the brain is being affected. So as I mentioned earlier, midbrain houses the nucleus of cranial nerve three and four, pons has cranial nerve five, six, seven, and eight, and medulla has cranial nerve nine, 10, and 12. The next concept that you have to know is that which arteries supply these regions of the brain. So it's the posterior cerebral artery that supplies the midbrain. So if you have problem with the posterior cerebral artery, then there would be problem with cranial nerve three and four. The basilar artery, and more specifically the ICO, is supplying the pons, which houses the nucleus of cranial nerve five, six, seven, and eight. And then medulla is being supplied by two different arteries, the vertebral artery, and more specifically, the pica or posterior inferior cerebellar artery is supplying the cranial nerve nine and 10, while the anterior spinal artery is supplying the cranial nerve 12, which is located at the lower portion of the medulla. So anterior cerebral artery supplies cranial nerve 12, while the pica branch of the vertebral artery supplies cranial nerve nine and 10. Now, Having this information in mind, now let's go through those syndromes and then interpret the lesions of these uh, syndromes together. So with the Weber syndrome, let's say on examination, they don't tell you that the patient has Weber syndrome. They just tell you that there's a lesion of the brain, one of the vessels is occluded, as a consequence of which the patient has strabismus, dilated pupils, and ptosis, from which you can tell that the patient has ipsilateral cranial nerve three palsy. So we just discussed earlier that the nucleus of cranial nerve three and cranial nerve four are located inside the midbrain. And midbrain is being supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. So therefore, if there is problem with the cranial nerve three, therefore there is problem with the posterior cerebral artery, which can cause midbrain defects. And so therefore, for the same reason, the other name for the Weber syndrome is medial midbrain syndrome. And then one other important point that I would like to mention is that you should know that posterior cerebral artery also supplies the occipital lobe of the brain. And so patients that have uh, lesions of the posterior cerebral artery can also present with the contralateral homonymous hemianopsia with macular sparing. So you can see that the macular area is not affected. And the reason for that is that the macular area is being supplied by the anterior choroidal artery, which is a branch of the internal carotid artery. So it's independent. The mac macular area is independent of the posterior cerebral artery. And so therefore it won't be affected with lesions of the posterior cerebral artery. The next lesion is the lateral pontine syndrome. And so patients, so let's say that we didn't know that it's a lateral pontine syndrome. Let's say that they just gave us the presentations of the patients. There is ipsilateral loss of facial pain and temperature. So this is from the lesion of trigeminal nerve five. 
There is facial paralysis, loss of lacrimation, loss of salivation, loss of taste perception in the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, loss of corneal reflex, and then finally hyperacusis from the lesion of the stapedius muscle. So all of these are due to lesion of cranial nerve 7. And then finally, if it's lateral hearing loss from the lesion of cranial nerve 8. So we discussed that cranial nerve 5, 6, 7, and 8 so the nuclei of these cranial nerves are all located in the pons. And pons is being supplied by the basilar artery and more specifically the ICA branch of the basilar artery. So therefore this patient has problem with the ICA artery which affects the pons. And so now that you refer to it, it's easy. It's the lateral pontine syndrome, which is now making sense. So here, let's go over that again. So the ICA branch of the basilar artery is supplying the pons, which supplies cranial nerve 5, 6, 7, and 8. The next syndrome is the Wallenberg syndrome, where there would be ipsilateral paralysis of the larynx and pharynx, as a consequence of which there would be dysarthria, dysphagia, loss of gag reflex, and hoarseness. And so these are due to lesions of the cranial nerve 9 and cranial nerve 10. And these are located inside the medulla, so, and so therefore this patient has lesion of the medulla. And medulla was being supplied by the vertebral artery, for cranial nerve 9 and 10 and then also there was an anterior spinal artery that was supplying the cranial nerve 12 of the medulla. So here therefore due to the lesion of the pica branch of the vertebral artery there is now problem with cranial nerve 9 and 10. And then with the next syndrome, which is medial medullary syndrome, there is ipsilateral paralysis of the tongue, which is cranial nerve 12. And so it's from the lesion of the anterior spinal artery. So let's go over that again. So here we have the medulla that has cranial nerve 9 and 10, as well as cranial nerve 12. We discussed earlier that cranial nerve 9 and 10 are being supplied by the pica branch of the vertebral artery while cranial nerve 12 is being supplied by the anterior spinal artery. And so you can see that after knowing this concept, it's really easy to find out what are the lesions that are associated with the blockage of any one of these arteries. Now, one final point that I would like to discuss in this video is that you should also know that aneurysms in the circle of villus can also affect the cranial nerve three and cause cranial nerve three palsy. So I'm going to ask you this question. Um, aneurysm of which of these arteries is associated with the development of the cranial nerve three palsy? And so in order to understand the concept of it, you have to know that the cranial nerve three passes from under the posterior cerebral artery and then runs along the path of the posterior communicating artery. So therefore, aneurysms of the posterior communicating artery are commonly affecting the cranial nerve 3 and cause cranial nerve 3 palsy. Now you should also know that there has been reports where aneurysms of for instance basilar artery as well as the carotid artery has led to the cranial nerve 3 palsy, but it's most commonly from the aneurysms in the posterior communicating artery. And that concludes our discussion.